Hello, hello. For our project, Micah, Roshan, and I tried to predict the outcomes of pitches in Major League Baseball. Over the years in Major League Baseball, data has become increasingly abundant, and recently, as you can see, the amount of data available to the public has exploded exponentially. Specifically, a lot of this data has to do with real-time information about pitches. For example, the type of pitch thrown, the velocity of a pitch when leaving the pitcher's hand, and etc. Given the abundance of data available to us, we wanted to see how different models could predict whether the batter makes contact with any given pitch, and if they don't make contact, whether the pitch was ruled a ball or a strike. Important to this task, though, is that aside from all of the concrete data available to us, because of human imperfection, there is a lot of random chance that goes into the outcome of each pitch. So, the focus of our project is testing several different models to see how they deal with this highly random, high-dimensional classification task. For data pre-processing and cleaning, we focus our research on the 2019 season as it gives us a large amount of data, with it not being an overwhelming amount. We mainly focus on using features of the dataset that contain information about the unique pitch characteristics rather than focusing on who the fielders were or the batted ball characteristics. The goal of our project was to predict the outcome of each pitch. Whether the pitch was either a ball, strike, or the batter made contact. In the data set, the outcome of each pitch is labeled as the description. There are 15 unique descriptions, but we combine to make three. K nearest neighbors was the simplest algorithm that we tested. Despite this, because of the breadth of data that we had, all of the distance calculations that occurred when testing our nearest neighbors models still took a lot of time. As you can see from the graph on the right, performance rises and falls as k rises, as you would expect. More importantly though, you can see the importance of normalizing your data, because the models trained on normalized data performed significantly better across the board than those that were not. Our optimal k was 50, which gave an accuracy of 61% when using normalized data. The second model we tested was XGBoost. We used Aladdin Hypercube with a five-fold cross-validation to hyperparameter tune our XGBoost model. Aladdin Hypercube is a space-filling design so that the hyperparameter space can be covered as well as possible without having to test every unique combination of hyperparameters. We decided to tune six hyperparameters, ETA, gamma, subsample, cold sample by tree, max depth, and min child weight. ETA is the learning rate, Gamma, also known as the min split loss, is the minimum loss reduction required to make a further partition on a leaf node of the tree. The larger the gamma is, the more conservative the algorithm will be. Subsample is the subsample ratio of the training instances. Setting it to 0.5 means that XGBoost would randomly sample half of the training data prior to growing the trees, and this will prevent overfitting. Subsampling will occur once in every boosting iteration. Cold sample by tree is the subsample ratio of columns when constructing each tree. Subsampling occurs once for every tree constructed. Max depth is the maximum depth of the tree. Increasing this value will make the model more complex and more likely to overfit. Min child weight is the minimum sum of, of instance weighted needed in a child. If the tree partition step results in a leaf node with the sum of instance weight less than min child weight, then the building process will give up further partitioning. The larger the min child weight is, the more conservative the algorithm will be. The figure on the right side of the screen shows the results of the hyperparameter tuning. The main trend that emerges is that it seems like higher values of ETA performs better, but also that several combinations of the hyperparameters perform well. We use the results from the hyperparameter tuning to run one last XGBoost model. It performed with an accuracy of 69.42%. On the right-hand side of the screen is the feature importance from the model. We can see that plate X and plate Z, which are the horizontal and vertical position of the ball when it crosses home plate from the catcher's perspective, which inherently makes sense. For example, if a pitch is thrown way outside and a couple feet away from the strike zone, then there's a very little chance that a batter is going to try and hit that pitch or that an umpire is going to call it a strike. The first GBM model we explored was Scikit-Learn's Base Gradient Boosting Classifier. Gradient boosting works by iteratively building n regression trees where n is the number of classes you're trying to predict. Our base GBM was trained with only one modification to parameters, 
we set subsample equal to 0.9 in hopes of dealing with overfitting. To check the accuracy of this model, we performed 10-fold cross-validation. We found the accuracy to be 69%. You'll notice that tenfold cross-validation was not used for the other gradient boosting models. This is because the base GBM is significantly slower than light GBM, so we couldn't do a hundred rounds of bootstrapping. Tenfold cross-validation with all the training records took about 24 minutes. On to light GBM. We tested three types of light GBM models: gradient boosting decision tree, which is the default. DART, and GOSS. To produce confidence intervals, we used 100 rounds of bootstrapping. From the confidence intervals, we can see that the base light GBM performed the best and was also better than the base GBM. We can also see that DART performed the worst predictively and for training time. On to hyperparameter tuning. We used random search CV to search for many hyperparameters. One thing to note is that we used an evaluation set made up of a subset of the training examples for early stopping. This was required for the n iter no change parameter. After performing a similar 100 round bootstrap to before, the 95% bootstrap confidence interval for this tune model was around 0.723 and 0.729. You can see from the confidence interval of our untuned light GBM, we are slightly more accurate after tuning. Our last model is a neural network. We tried models both with and without convolutional layers, and we compared performance when using rectified linear units and soft pluses activation functions. When training the neural networks, we used validation set accuracy as an indicator for early stopping, and we played around with the depth and width of the models. You can see on the right how more layers and more nodes affected model performance. After varying convolutional layers, we found that one 3x3 convolutional layer improved model performance, but multiple convolutional layers actually decreased performance, contrary to the current conventional wis wisdom. We also found that through a grid search of layers and nodes, that depth and width improved model performance, but increasing depth too much quickly led to intense overfitting. The best hyperparameters that we found was one convolutional layer without any pooling, feeding into a network of five dense layers with 64 nodes each. Each of the nodes used the rectified linear unit activation function, and the model had a learning rate of 5e-4. This model came barely short of the LGBM model with an accuracy of 70%. The accuracy of our models hovered around 69 to 72%, with the light GBMs coming out on top. It was hard to get a high prediction accuracy because we are trying to predict something for which we can't possibly have all the data. Also, even though there's a lot of publicly available data, the amount of private data is still immense. Baseball also has a lot of randomness built into every pitch. Human elements are involved when the umpire makes the decision of a pitch being a ball or a strike. Also, individual players can be somewhat predictable, but when combining many players, their interactions make things more random.